So welcome everyone to another session of our research user group. So today's topic uh, has been uh, requested for a long time, but we never actually got to cover it. So we'll be moments, and um, we have uh, Jamie and Scott from G Research to present how they are handling this and, and uh, teach us how to how we should do it. So uh, yeah, on to you, Jamie. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, let me see if I can work out how to share my screen. Don't think I have shared on this platform before. Whoa, there we go. All right, can you see that before we kick off? Yeah, it looks great. Great, okay. All right, so um, yeah, this is uh, me and Scott are going to talk to you a little bit about uh, bare metal Kubernetes at G Research. So uh, not necessarily telling you exactly how to do it, or how the only way it can be done, but just talking a bit about our adventures with it, what we're up to, uh, what we've learned along the way. Um, so in terms of introductions, uh, we've actually both of us been to CERN to visit um, Ricardo and co, uh, and have managed to get the obligatory photo in front of, um, I think that's Alice. Um, so we put those next to each other. But yeah, I'm Jamie Poole. Um, most of you probably know me because I co-host this uh, with Ricardo every other week anyway, although I haven't been around for a few weeks, so apologies for that. Um, and I'm the uh, Compute Platform Engineering Manager here at G Research, so responsible for all things uh, Kubernetes and batch compute and uh, calc farm and, and that kind of thing. And then I've got Scott here with me, who I'll let introduce. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Scott. So I'm a cloud engineer. I work um, mostly on OpenStack, uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, a lot of that is at the moment so ironic. Cool. Um, very, very brief bit about G Research for those of you who don't know. So we're a fintech company based in London. Uh, we run a large distributed uh, research platform for teams of quants to look for patterns in real world noisy data sets of uh, financial data, uh, looking for, for patterns for, for our clients. Um, and currently we're we're still, I've been saying this for a while, but it's still true, uh, migrating large amounts of our batch compute workloads uh, from um, Windows and HD Condor onto uh, Kubernetes and Linux and containerization and all of that good stuff. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, we'll go straight into the ironic portion of the presentation, which I'll hand over to Scott for. Okay, so uh, so yeah, a little bit of a background first of all. So what is Ironic? Ironic is an integrated OpenStack service which aims to provision bare metal machines instead of virtual machines. Uh, so Ironic supports using vendor-specific plugins which implement additional functionalities such as moving machines between different networks. Um, so uh, yeah, and the main things about, well, the main thing for this talk really is to focus on the different states we have in Ironic. It's not limited to these, but the main ones are enrolling, cleaning, holding and provisioning. So how does it work under the hood? Um, so Ironic is pretty straightforward. Uh, so what it is, it does IPMI and Pixie um, and a mix of, mix of that and a RAM disk image. Um, and then it turns machines on and off and moves them between different networks um, as they move different through different parts of the build. So Ironic can be, can be deployed standalone, but the most common way to do it and probably like in a production environment, um, it sort of sits beside uh, um, other OpenStack projects, such as like Nova, Neutron and Glance. So a bit of background. So Nova is used for uh, deploying like VMs, like virtual machines. Neutron is your networking and then Glance is like an image catalog. Um, so yeah, uh, Ironic will use those uh, different services um, to, to get images or change networks or whatever it needs to do. Uh, so the good thing as well is when a bare metal machine is deleted uh, by the user, it's cleaned and then um, it's just returned back into the available pool. And then someone can else just, someone else can just pick it out of that, that pool. So this is really high level. Um, diagram just to show, sort of show um, the sort of enrollment uh, stage that we've got. So if you look on the left there, there's a few open source products we use. Um, so one is Kyobi, which is a, um, a sort of a sub project of the Color Ansible project in OpenStack and that's used to deploy, uh, also use it to deploy um, new bare metal nodes into Ironic as well. Uh, so essentially it's just a bunch of Ansible and we use, um, we use Jenkins to sort of uh, to, to uh, orchestrate that, I guess. Um, so if we look at what the enrollment phase actually does, so 
we go through pre-inspection first of all it's just like the the pre-steps before you can actually look at the nodes um, and work out what what's going on in there so um, we create a record of it in the OpenStack API then we set the resource class we buy we apply some baseline BIOS and ILO settings the important bit here is the resource class so a resource class essentially is just like um, defines like what a node like a type of node so you might have like a certain type of GPU node or CPU node or like specialist hardware um, you need to find that as a resource class it basically says this is what my server should look like it should have this much RAM these disks um, and all that kind of all that stuff so um, we define all that and we say this is what I expect these new nodes to look like and then we go through to the next phase which is inspection which is an ironic sort of state so it will turn the server on pixie boot into a the RAM disk, and then it will discover what hardware is there, check for things like cabling issues and um, identify the switch it's plugged into. So when we move it, we know which switch to log into to actually move the port. Um, and then it will go and create those ports in Ironic. Um, so what that allows us to do is then basically cross check between the resource class and what the, what the um, server actually actually has inside it. Because if you've got, if you think if you've got a big pool of servers um, and you hand one back and you take a new one, you want to make sure that you're getting the, the same server back. Well, not literally the same, but one that has the same spec. So once we've done the inspection, we can we then know where it's plugged in and which switch, switch port. So uh, Neutral will then move it to uh, what's known as the cleaning VLAN, which is essentially the same as like the cleaning state. Uh, and then we go through a, like a what's known as cleaning. So cleaning it runs inside the RAM disk image again. And what it does is uh, it will just boot into it and it will have like a set of steps. They're basically Python scripts and it will just run through those uh, in order of priority. So we do things like updating firmware, verifying that the ILO settings are all correct, NTP, um, set up the storage, we wipe the hard disks, and then we check if there's GPUs in there, we check their health as well. Once it's done that, um, it should be good to go almost. So we just finally run some tests on it. So we run some burn-in tests and then we move it to the holding VLAN, and then it goes from cleaning into the holding state. But that essentially means it's ready for a user to pick it up the other side. So if we just look back at that diagram, we should understand this a little bit more now. Um, so nodes come in from the left through our automation into Ironic API. We inspect them, and then they get moved into where they are in the data center. So a conductor basically is a microservice in Ironic, which, is, um, which its purpose is to sort of look after a group of nodes. So you might have like a common set of nodes or like, a, like an area in a data center, like an availability zone or something like that. Um, so they all just get bunched up and yeah, and then it's all ready for ready for people to use the other side. So moving on onto the deployment side. Um, so there's a person there, they will pick um, a flavor and a network and an AZ and an image. Um, and then that transforms into some Nova, uh, some stuff that happens in Ironic, in OpenStack, and then out pops a bare metal node the other side. So if we just take a little bit of a closer look at that, what happens is the user requests the new bare metal machine via Terraform, in our case, but I mean, you can just do it via the API if you really want to. Um, and then the flavor selected is the thing that maps to the resource class. So earlier when I said you've got a resource class, is like a type of server. The flavor is basically the user defining what type of server that, that they actually want to pull from the pool. And then um, the network and the availability zone that they select maps to some sort of location within a data center. That allows you to sort of scale this to quite a lot, um, uh, quite a lot of servers. Uh, so yeah, if we look back here, that's just that first bit, just up here. So the user selects, and then they go into the OpenStack um, process. So the OpenStack side of the process, um, you hit the you hit the Nova API, then that will talk to placement and the scheduler. And that will basically look in the pool and it will say what's available give me the first node off the top or the first hundred nodes or the first thousand nodes whatever many you select neutron will then go and move all of those into the provisioning vlan so then they go into that provisioning state so we go from holding back into provisioning and then this, this is the state where we get ready for the user to use so in machine provisioning we turn the server on um using ipmi we pixie boot into the round disk image and then we apply a few BIOS settings that might be like um, hyper threading on or off. That's probably the most common one, but you can you can configure anything you want um, as long as it's available via the, the API. 
Um, and then we pull the user's image from Glance. So the user will specify that image when they actually build the machine. They don't want to run the RAN disk image because that's got all our tools in it and got their tools in it. So this would, in, um, in our case, be Flatcar would get pulled from Glance, which is the image service in OpenStack. So that basically explains the box there on the right. Uh, so yeah, request comes in, schedules, Nova Compute will coordinate um, some stuff in Neutron to move it to the right uh, VLAN. And then the ironic conductor will pull the image down, put it on the node. And then, and then from there, all we need to do is move the VLAN again into the, the requested um, VLAN that the, the user wanted. And then uh, we just restart the server and then the server will just boot into a, into an OS and then present a prompt screen that the user can log into. That means, yeah, then hopefully we've got, everyone's got bare metal servers and then they're happy to go and use their, um, their, their fleet of servers now. That is all good until the user then is finished with the server. So the, the idea between Ironic is sort of cattle, not pets. So you use a server for a lot of time or however long you need it. And then you can hand it back, go through cleaning, and then it goes available, ready for someone else to use. So it's really, really flexible. So yeah, the user deletes the server. Neutron uh, goes and moves the server to cleaning. We go through those same cleaning steps. So if the firmware has changed since um, since the users handed back the machine, then that will get updated, wipes all the disks, so it's all nice and secure when uh, the new user use, uh, gets given the server. Um, and yeah, we checked that it hasn't been tampered with or anything like that as well, just for extra security checks. Uh, and then yeah, Neutron will finally move it into holding and then, and then it becomes available again. So just to recap on those states. So first of all, you enroll the node into Ironic, then it sits there and it's ready for the user to use. Um, and then we've got cleaning between holding and provisioning really. So yeah, enrolling, cleaning, holding, provisioning. That's about it really, over to you. Yeah. All right, and then more onto the sort of how we use this for Kubernetes and research purposes side of things, I suppose. So we uh, historically, well, we've always run Kubernetes in G research on OpenStack. Um, for a long time, we've been doing it on on VMs, but more recently, we've started moving on to uh, building clusters using bare metal. Uh, but this process is pretty much the same regardless. We just use a different flavor, as uh, Scott was talking about. So the way we tend to do it is we define our clusters in um, Terraform um, uh, Terraform code in GitHub. Uh, we then use Terraform Enterprise, in our case, to build the clusters um, uh, into OpenStack using Ironic. Uh, the machines are built and configured using uh, the Flatcar operating system. Uh, and then Flatcar uh, uses Ignition to uh, pull down um, user data and configure a very minimal Kubernetes installation. So our initial bootstrap task basically gets us a, a small bare metal server, uh, sorry, collection of servers running a Kubernetes cluster, uh, pretty vanilla. Um, currently, we still do um, the etcd nodes as virtual machines, but for our larger and higher performance clusters, we now use Ironic and bare metal for the master nodes and all the worker nodes as well. Uh, once we have a, a minimal cluster, then we apply our more uh, detailed Kubernetes configuration on top. Typically, we do that these days using Jenkins or um, Argo CD, or a combination of the two, actually, uh, sort of undergoing a bit of a migration at the moment. And that's just how we then deploy all of our sort of desired state uh, Kubernetes configuration on top. So things along the lines of ingress controllers and Calico and all the other bits and pieces and things that we want to have in our clusters to make them look and feel like our uh, desired GR clusters. Uh, once we've done that, we then deploy Armada. So this is an a application which I've talked about a bunch uh, of times at, at this uh, in this forum. So I won't go into too much detail now, but this is just uh, the overall architecture diagram of the, the application which we typically deploy on top of these clusters. So you can see here the, the blue boxes at the bottom of the screen are, are uh, Kubernetes clusters in this sort of new world of bare metal. These are all high performance bare metal clusters. Uh, quite a large number of nodes. We tend to scale up to about a thousand, uh, and then one Armada server sitting on top, which allows our use, users to submit jobs to uh, run on the hardware. Um, a couple of notes just on some benefits we've seen so far. So th this is really the reasons for us moving to this model in the first place. So it, it's still early days, but the things, sorts of things we've seen are uh, increased stability. So um, Certainly for things like GPU intensive workloads, we had seen some issues when we were running on virtualization that have just completely evaporated since moving to bare metal. Uh, it's certainly been a lot simpler than trying to debug sort of uh, 
kernel level issues within the within the virtualization layer just to, to move to bare metal and not really worry about it. Um, some other benefits we've seen are things like increased network throughput between nodes and external resources, uh, being able to use BGP peering very easily, uh, can be done with VMs, but it's a little bit more complex. Um, for us as well, typically we end up with much larger nodes because your bare metal servers tend to be a bit bigger than your average virtual machine by definition, I suppose. Um, and for us, it's just simpler state management as well. So we have far fewer layers between our, our workloads uh, and our hardware. Um, fewer machines, fewer bigger machines tends to be slightly easier to manage than tens of thousands of smaller um, virtual machines. Uh, however, there are some limitations as well. So some of the things we've noticed so far, certainly um, a slower provisioning time, which is actually completely expected. As you can imagine, when you're provisioning a bare metal server, you're actually basically turning on a real machine and you have to wait for it to power on. Um, with a virtual machine, all of that sort of abstracted away from you, you don't really see it. Um, there's a lot more precise quota management required. I think you can be a little bit more fast and loose when you're running a large virtual estate. You can oversubscribe things and uh, you know oversubscribe CPUs and things like that. It's much harder to do in a bare metal environment. You're very much constrained by the physical resource you actually have. Um, it is a little bit less flexible in some ways, and there's some features of virtualization which we don't get as a, as a side effect. So. Things like being able to snapshot a VM are quite useful. You can't do that natively uh, using a bare metal server. So you have to sort of roll something or use some other tool to do that. And we have also noticed in the Kubernetes world, it can be a little bit tricky sometimes to mix and match in cluster, having virtual machines and physical machines. So we've tended to take the approach of just starting from scratch and building new clusters as bare metal from the beginning rather than trying to add it into existing virtual clusters. But yeah, in summary, um, for us, we're, we're now using bare metal Kubernetes for our highest performance workloads. Um, we're still also making heavy use of virtualization where appropriate. So for our more sort of classic Kubernetes clusters, if you like, for services and so forth, we're still making good use of VMs. Uh, but for the clusters where we really care about performance and we're running lots and lots of high throughput jobs, then we are now moving to bare metal and OpenStack Ironic is our metal as a service choice. I think that's it. Bit of a whistle stop tour, but are there any questions? Awesome, thank you, Jamie and Scott. That was a nice, nice summary. Um, I'm, anyone has any questions? Feel free to just go for it and ask. I will have a couple, but uh, I'll leave the floor for two others first. I'm um, here. I have a question. Um, did you look at any other? tool suites uh, besides um, um, Ironic, or was were you set on Ironic? Because uh, I believe it's an open stack project, right? Is it is, already... yeah. OK. We have looked at some other things. Um, we're relatively opinionated about it, I suppose, because we've already got quite a foothold in Ironic, uh, uh, sorry, in OpenStack, using lots of other OpenStack um, uh, services, as Scott mentioned. Uh, we have actually on i think independently ahead of ironic rolled our own metal as a service um yeah. system internally which does work as well uh but it's kind of nice to be able to use the off the shelf open source tooling that fits in nicely with the rest of our ecosystem okay uh, but i know there's other things as well like maz and others that we we haven't evaluated at, at, at in depth but yeah ironic seems to work well for us thank you All right. OK, so Alex, did you have a question as well? So you were muted at some point. I was just wondering whether they had um, looked at the, you know, you mentioned the provisioning times were slow, um, whether there was any uh, looking at pre-provisioning, uh, the sort of expected images that you're going to spin up. Um, I know that when we had the uh, on metal service at Rackspace before we switched over to Ironic, that was part of the whole plot, was to pre-spin up these uh, bare metal servers. Okay. And it was supposed to come back in Ironic, but and that was years ago, but I don't know whether that's actually come back. So It's not something we've used yet. I mean, certainly some things we've looked at in our processes where we can save time. For, maybe you can cover this, but some of the things like BIOS settings and things where we want to make sure we eliminate the requirement for reboots and things mm. like that, I suppose, during the process. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there's there's a little bit of that we can trim um, around. But, um, yeah, so 
the, the way it's designed is you have one big pool of data, uh, sorry, of, of nodes, and you can sort of have multiple tenants using that. Where we don't have that, um, there, there's some stuff that we can sort of pull out, like, for example, the bar settings, um, they're, they're applied at like a provision time. If they're static, then you just don't have to reapply them every time. You just have to make sure in cleaning that no one's tampered with them. And then that you can save a bit of time there. Also, there's there's lots of things you can do around like caching images and all that kind of thing. And actually for us, that's something that has been relatively easy because it's um, because these, these Kubernetes uh, clusters tend to use the same image. And then right. we have lots of them that use the same image. So everything gets cached and it's all kind of hot at all times pretty much. So um, there's more things. If that becomes slow in the future, we can, can move Glance closer to the actual bare metal nodes. But at the moment, we're finding that um, the cache is pretty warm. And um, yeah, we're, yeah it's, it's performing pretty well. One thing which I noticed, which surprised me actually in my own reaction to it, I mean, is uh, the first time I saw it, it took 20 minutes to to build a server, I was like, oh shit, this is a nightmare. This is going to make everything really slow and difficult um, because I'm used to a VM spinning up in 30 seconds or something. But actually, when you're used to it and you're doing things at large scale and in bulk, it doesn't really matter if one server takes 20 minutes, if you can build hundreds or, or thousands simultaneously, um, you actually end up caring a lot more about reliability and being comfortable that your automation will just work and you can walk away from it and come back later and everything will be up and running. It would be much worse if it was faster but less reliable. So I always sort of err on the side of reliability over performance, personally, of, of the build, that is. Once it's up and running, we want performance as well, obviously. I mean, for us, if we have long running jobs that take days, 20 minutes is neither here nor there. But, Indeed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 20 minutes is slightly uh, anecdotal, I would say. That's, that's our current experience for a certain type of flavor hmm. but it's, uh, it's it's of the order of minutes no longer seconds put it that way so is is that the mode of operation that everybody want so if uh, somebody submits to to run a particular workload they get provisioned a particular resource or resource type it's not that some things are long lived and people kind of swap or you know, yeah, interchangeably use the same standing resource. It depends how you choose to use it. In our model, what we do is we have uh, a bunch of hardware and built into clusters ahead of time, which sit there and are used relatively constantly by a collection of different users. So in effect, the hardware is all being a large pool of hardware is all being shared by lots of different people. Um, we're quite lucky in the sense that we've got a relatively, in, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively small pool of researchers all doing quite a similar thing. So we can be quite uh, prescriptive about the hardware that they'll get. So we have a smallish number of flavors of CPU nodes and similar GPU nodes and potentially in future other accelerators. Um, it might be the case that in other companies who do, or other organizations even, who want to do a more like, I guess, offer metal as a service or cluster as a service up to users to actually create their own, that that would be a possibility. But for us, we we take, take the more sort of, we provision it, we being the infrastructure and platform teams, and then our, our users within our organization then just use what we've provisioned for them. But this would lend itself to people provisioning their own if they wanted to. How does it work that they, they submit a ticket and you, you take care of that? Uh, it depends what you mean. So generally speaking, the way we, we have it is we have a, a, this, these pools of compute, which we understand uh, the, the sort of flavors and qualities of, and then we have a bunch of tools and software which allow users to then run jobs on them. So they don't, it's not a ticketing system. It's really a case of they can just, they, they are already set up with access to this large pool of compute, and then they can submit jobs to then use the hardware as they see fit. So effectively run run jobs as pods in Kubernetes, ultimately is what happens on top of the hardware that happens to be provisioned through Ironic. Okay. So to get a sense of their time scale, how long do the clusters live? And, and or if it's like a dynamic cluster, how long does the uh, the nodes typically live? Like, uh, you know, yep. six months on a cluster and every few weeks uh, things shrink and grow? Or what's, what's the... Yeah, so it, it looks loosely like this. So we actually have multiple of, of this whole picture, in fact. But if we just look at one of these as an example, imagining this is a data center, we have many of these clusters under here. Uh, each one of these clusters uh, itself 
the, the cluster, I suppose, in 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 of itself may even last for years. We might create it, you know, a couple of years ago, say, and it's still running now, and we'll still be running jobs on it. The nodes themselves, we tend to quite frequently rebuild um, because I think we actually have a bit of a fetish for sort of rebuilding stuff in GR and making sure everything comes back clean and, and tidy. Um, so we actually have a separate project at the moment going on to um, ensure we're constantly rebuilding things and making sure there's a maximum lifetime of the actual nodes, but clusters themselves can last for quite a long time. Um, we probably also eventually, I think, will move into a more rolling cluster rebuild process as well, because obviously that's long lived state itself, which could get dirty or, or out of sync somehow. It shouldn't, but it's possible. But no, generally speaking, the clusters themselves live for quite a long time, and then the nodes within them are of the order of tens of days, maximum a couple of months. So this architecture is really for um, at that facilitator level where you're you're building environments for individuals, and you're you're keeping a you're, you're moving with whatever the ongoing research is, and that the research yeah, exactly. are short time scales on the pods and whatever. Yes, the pods. Yeah, exactly. So we've got like time scales within time scales. The pods themselves are anything from uh seconds up to uh, a couple of weeks say and then the nodes and the clusters last for a lot longer and they will they're just sort of uh, running this primordial soup of of user workload um but also just using ironic or any kind of metal as a service is also just a useful thing if people have a sort of high performance requirements or just have a different estate management process i suppose so i know ricardo and the guys at cern don't do this model so we we have a model where we create clusters and then effectively offer you can think of it as like namespace as a service so that tenancy is the thing which we offer people on the existing clusters whereas i think well certainly when last time we were talked about it over in cern they're doing more sort of cluster as a service so people can ask for their own clusters which then may use something like ironic in fact do you do that ricardo do you have ironic as an option yeah under the clusters as well yeah so you do exactly that yeah you can even have uh, like uh, mixed clusters with uh, node groups or node right. pools in VMs and additional node pools using bare metal. Makes sense. I had a question because you mentioned it's a kind of follow up for the last one, which is uh, you you described the workflow with GitHub and then the provisioning using Terraform. How, mm -hmm. Do you also use this for like cluster upgrades, or or is the, is this like you just redeploy from scratch a new cluster? That's a good question. So we tend to use uh, the cluster bootstrap thing is, is kind of a one time thing to build a cluster. Uh, if we have quite a long lived cluster, then we can actually do all of our upgrades then from this point onwards, if this makes sense. So things like upgrading Kubernetes itself, um, we have uh, a bunch of tooling to do that. So we can do it in place cluster upgrades, um, even the kubelet on all the nodes as well, because that in itself is containerized. Um, and similarly, then uh, operating system upgrades we can do in a rolling fashion because we have this model where here underneath the long lived cluster, the nodes get rebuilt sort of sequentially underneath the cluster uh, with error budgets and so forth so that we don't do the whole thing at once. Um, but we have options. We can also, if we want, just completely blow, you know, coordinate, wait for stuff to drain and then blow it away and, and rebuild it all if we want to do upgrades. But yeah, we, we tend to tend to just you i guess the separation we have is terraform tends to be used for the no the cluster slash node build process and then everything afterwards is through all right stuff, like jenkins and Margo and so forth okay and uh, the other the other question i had was uh like uh there, there's quite a lot of activity in the thing i to to kind of uh, manage the clusters from as if they were kubernetes resources and then just build on things like argo to Kind of make everything uniform. Yes. Is this something that you've looked into, and is because I, I was just searching now for the integration of like Metal as a service components into a cluster API. Is this something that would simplify, or that you would not consider? Uh, I would definitely consider it, and I'm very excited about it, and I would like to do it at some point. But it's just never quite been up the priority list enough for us in our world. I think what it would end up doing is effectively replacing Terraform. Yeah. I think basically we would be going straight from GitHub. Well, I suppose we'd have something to bootstrap our initial cluster somehow, and then the cluster API would then go off yeah. and talk straight to OpenStack. But hopefully everything we've already done would then continue to integrate nicely, and we would just use that directly. So I think it's really a question of how well supported OpenStack is by the cluster API. Right. Well, I, haven't, I haven't checked recently, but yeah, it would be very interesting to do that. Cool.
And certainly a limitation we found, um, not of bare metal specifically, but as soon as you get to large scale Kubernetes or, or any configurations, in fact, within Terraform, it is a bit slow. Um, it has effectively maintains a big graph of resources, uh, which it has, it has to walk the, walk the graph every time you make any kind of change. And especially when every resource is actually a remote thing that has to go off and be checked, then you can imagine that ends up translating into a lot of API calls, which can be quite slow and expensive. So if we could turn that into something a bit more elegant using Kubernetes itself, I'm all for it. Makes sense. Checking here if there's other questions in the chat of someone. Ah, there you go. Um, when you, um, I have another question. Um, so uh, do you, does your team manage the networking equipment? Um, and do you have like kind of broad control over that? Or do you work with the networking team? Uh, we have a networking team who's more responsible for that. So um, within our organization, we have a few different functions and different areas responsible for different things. So we've got an infrastructure function and a platform function, me, me and Scott okay. from both of those respectively. Uh, there is a team within the infrastructure function who deals with networking specifically. Um, but what we're definitely finding is having more cross-functional teams is really powerful. So I've got people in my team who have got really strong networking skills and understand that kind of stuff, including down to the hardware. Um, and I actually suspect over time, we're probably going to need to develop some kind of special cross-functional team that just looks at performance and tuning of the estate, basically, because we need to be able to do it all the way from top to bottom, really, especially when we're now dealing with metal, you know, we actually need to understand how everything's configured all the way down to the BIOS. Yeah, um, we, you know, we use a lot of, we have a lot of bare metal and uh, VMs, um, and we've just there's this friction with the say, networking team, professional disagreements maybe over how the switches should be uh, managed. Um, and I saw like in, during your presentation, you were switching VLANs and, uh, at the beginning and it seemed like you had a, a decent amount of control. Yes. Of the network. Yeah, we, I, think, I think we do. Um, our networking team is quite sort of up to speed with everything that we're doing as well. And uh, I mean, we, like you say, though, there was always friction sometimes between teams because different teams sometimes operate at different rates. And when we've got responsibility shared across the groups, it can be tricky. But um, we've got quite a sort of singular purpose at the moment. To, there's a particular large project happening at the moment, which involves a lot of this stuff. So we've got a lot of people from different teams all working together to, to make it happen. So it's quite nice. And, and these clusters are, are fairly large. There are uh, dozens or hundreds of servers. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, to, I mean, up to about a thousand nodes wow. in, a, in a given cluster. Um, wow. We could go, we've actually decided arbitrarily to sort of stop about there. But the, that was, in fact, one of the reasons for the Armada architecture so that we could have many of these things um, because we're aware that past a certain limit, Kubernetes can't really scale much further. I think the official limit is still 5,000 nodes, but I know from I think anyone knows from going to conferences and things that you have to do quite a lot to, to get that far and then over backwards. So we have a model where we just go to about a thousand and then just plug in more clusters horizontally and scales quite well that way. And is Armada um, a G um, a G research project or is that? Um, yes. Yeah, no, it's, okay. Yeah, well, it's open source, but yeah, it's, it's come from G research. So yeah, there's a probably further back in the uh, uh, list of um, meetings, there'll be a recording of some stuff we've done specifically on this if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. I have one more. Um, you, me you mentioned the um, issues with GPUs and stability and uh, improvements by moving to bare metal. Yeah. What are you doing uh, PCI pass through, I guess, and in VMs? And do you remember which which specific issues you had and how did they improve? I think we were. Um, yes, is <laughs> yes, of course. Um, I can't remember the specific issues, but we were get, basically getting unexpected errors, okay. things report, being reported as, um, you know, not a number and that kind of thing, just mathematical errors, which shouldn't yep. have been happening um, under quite niche circumstances as well when we were running out of memory. And, you know, you'd have to have a few different failures happen in a certain way, but somehow we managed to always hit this scenario quite frequently and then we just thought well hey look rather than try and debug all this let's just see what happens if we run on bare metal and lo and behold the problem went away so sometimes it's just not worth sort of really yeah to these I, I ask is because we 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 have been seeing similar issues with virtual machines recently right and uh yeah that 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 is a tempting solution I guess it, I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you think you're just going through this whole extra layer that 
maybe you don't really need to. And there's an awful lot more software involved, isn't there, ultimately? Yeah, it, the, the issue is how, how many GPUs do you have per node on average? Yeah. Uh, for us, uh, up to about eight. All right. It's The issue is that for Kubernetes clusters, this is easy to handle. Mm. But for if you have a mix of VMs and Kubernetes clusters using those GPUs, actually virtualization allows you to like expose um, is on a multi GPU node quite easily. Yeah. Um, while if you just dedicate like bare metal nodes to 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 people directly, as you would do with VMs, then you basically like potentially give, giving them a, a, a really nice way to waste uh, precious resources. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's that's the reason why like for core nice cost is kind of a no brainer that you can go bare metal for GPUs. And just schedule uh, directly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. That was pretty pretty cool. Um, I have I have one one question. If I don't see anyone raising, like, it, I, I guess the question that a lot of people will have is if I have a bunch of nodes arriving on a new data center or whatever on premises. What, what would be the suggestion if I just want to do Kubernetes um, and on bare metal? Like, what's the the best option or, uh, or and the least uh, complicated option to get stuff up and running? In a sort of. Yeah. Um, quick fashion. I mean, I I don't know because I know what what we do, and we've got obviously quite opinionated about using. OpenStack and Ironic, I'm sure. I, I think one thing that probably can be said of Ironic and OpenStack is it can be quite complex and it's probably quite difficult to get up and running from uh, nothing. No, also, there's two projects that you probably, if you want to have a go to look at, um, which sort of lower that barrier to entry. So one is called Bifrost, which will allow you to just um, sort of run um, like Ironic from like a just a laptop. That's good for like bootstrapping new environments where you don't already have a control plane. Um, and then the other is what we actually use here to deploy all of our OpenStack, which is Collar Ansible. Um, that is a, it's basically a collection of uh, Ansible uh, roles. Um, and basically, a lot of the hard work has been done for you. Um, so a lot of it just kind of works out of the box. Uh, you can deploy it vanilla OpenStack really easily to like a couple of VMs on your machine. Or if you've got a couple of um, bare metal nodes, you can deploy a control plane there with relatively little OpenStack experience. Um, Tuning it and getting it um, to large scale is that, that takes a lot of time and experience and working through issues and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, if you want to get started, the barrier to entry is not really that high on yeah either Bifrost or uh, Colorant or really. I'd be really interested if we could do some kind of questionnaire for a wider gr group, obviously our group, but as wide as we can get it to find out when people are using Metal yeah. as a Service products, what they're using. Because yeah. I think even knowing what's out there is is a challenge sometimes. Yeah, I think that that comes back to this idea that we've had for a while, which is to do these recipes for different sorts of uh, yeah. uh, workloads that are kind of specific for research environments. I, I think like the deployment on premises and on bare metal is is something that is not like super common, maybe because like most users will be using public cloud providers or or some sort of commercial virtualization solution that is already available. So I don't know, for research institutions that want to have a bunch of nodes and want to, to get something up, up, up and running, maybe there's there's something we can provide uh, with some ideas or pointers. I guess we don't even have to have a recipe for it and say, do this, we, but we can say we, as a collective, have done these things. Yeah. We know that they work or they can, can be made to work. Uh, but yeah, that's good. she we didn't mention that in this presentation. All of our compute is is on prem. Yeah. Um, I suppose anyone using a, a cloud provider can also just use bare metal through through whatever they support as well. I think they all, all do now. I think that'd be very valuable for the university community. From what I can tell, most of the, uh, the bare metal clusters are hand created uh, on various various methods. So uh, that's what works and what works well would be definitely useful. Yeah. yeah, I think as soon as you do it any kind of scale, then the hand cranked method just sort of doesn't work. Spend your whole time doing it. 
I guess the, the dream is really this idea of the cluster API where you, you, you put some effort into the bootstrap cluster that yeah. you do by hand, but then everything else is kind of coming automatically via the cluster API. I don't know how far it gets because then you still need this kind of metal as a service component somewhere. Yeah, there's, there's enough bits of surrounding infrastructure you need still. Yeah. That would have to be set up by something. But maybe some of this will become more ubiquitous as time goes on, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, so maybe maybe we take this as an action just to to send around uh, like a survey like we did the last couple of times with uh, mm -hmm. asking specifically about bare metal deployments. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, also be for those going to KubeCon actually to do some research, that will be really valuable. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we, we don't have a talk this time. For the group, I don't know if there are other questions on the topic. Let me see. If there's any further, I'll give probably got time for one more if there is one more. Otherwise, I'll stop sharing. I think we're good. Five second rule, fine. Good. All right. Thanks a lot again, Jamie and Scott. That was pretty interesting. We don't have anything else today. So, but one one thing I was going to mention is uh, for KubeCon, we, we still have another session in two weeks, but uh, we don't have. Uh, talk this time, but uh, we, we should probably just circulate uh, like a, a slot or lunchtime or something where we all get together and, and yes. discuss a bit. It all started in Barcelona, so we might as well get together. In it is. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually going. I'm, I'm a bit gutted. I've got three people from my team are going to be there. Then, so, right. so I'll um, make sure I send them your way. Still escaping this, uh, this jam session. I can see. That. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Saving it up for Detroit. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> the blues. All right. That's. Um, I. I don't have anything else for today. And if anyone else wants to raise something, otherwise, hmm? I was just going to say I've realised I need a haircut as a result of this call as well while looking at myself. So I'm going to go and get that. <laughs> Well, next time. All right. Otherwise, we have uh, container SSH uh, in two weeks, um, and after that, KubeCon. So, yeah. Thanks everyone for attending, and we'll follow up also in the in the Slack channel. Thank you, everybody. Great awesome. to see you. All. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye. 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 Yes. See you.